seal on it and if you were in the meeting last night you will have learnt that that seal is to do with the Luciferian plan for a one world government. Some folks don't even know who Lucifer is. In New Zealand we have a daughter whose name is Rachel. Some of you will remember Johnny Kutsumanis, her husband. They live in Blenheim, New Zealand. And next door to the house where they live they have a giant dog there, a big dog, and they, nick nick they named the dog Satan. And uh, apparently the other day some folks knocked on the door of that house and their big dog came around and the lady said, what's the name of your dog? And the, lady said, and the other lady said, Satan. And the visitor said, for goodness sake, she was shocked. She said, why did you call it that? And the owner of the dog said, what's wrong with that? She says, don't you know what it means? And she said, no, I don't know. So when the husband came home, she asked him, what does Satan mean? And he said, the devil. And there was a woman who didn't even realize that. So night by night, I have to assume that people do not understand these terms. Lucifer was originally created by Almighty God, and in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, you will read that he was thrown out of heaven. He was one of the angels uh, to do with the music in heaven. And uh, as he was thrown out, he came down upon the earth. Let's read about it, shall we, in the book of Isaiah chapter 14 tonight. If you have a Bible, read with me. He is now called Satan, the God of this world, and he is also known by other titles such as the devil, and so on. We're reading Isaiah 14 tonight. Anybody with a King James Bible, where are you please? God bless you, the little remnant's getting bigger. We're reading? I'd like you to read with me these scriptures tonight, starting with verse 12. We're going to ask God's blessing upon the reading of His Holy Word. This is a very special book. Some people don't believe me that this is a different book. If you don't, you carry a book like that on the bus tomorrow, or on the train to town, and read it on the train, and notice the difference. You read any other book, nobody will take any notice of you. You read that book on the train, and what's the difference? People will walk past you like this. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your precious word tonight. We proclaim your word as truth. Bless us as we read. We honor you together in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's read together, shall we? Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Now there are five I wills. If you are a born again Christian and you die, it's important that you understand where you're going. And so we're going to draw a world here. This circle I have drawn is the earth. The little dotted piece around there is the atmosphere. We learn that Lucifer was thrown out of heaven. He is now called the God of this world. He's called the Prince of the Power of the Air. Remember that next time you're flying in an aeroplane, you're flying through his territory. We can tell you a few stories about frightening trips on planes, but not tonight. He's also called the Prince of this world. Now, if you're a born-again Christian and you die, this is what will happen. Your body will go to the grave. Your spirit will return to God that gave it, and your soul will go up to the third heaven. I'd like to number them like this. The third heaven is the cloudy one, the clouds. That's where Jesus disappeared into, and that's where he's coming back to. It's called paradise. 
some of been there some of you have heard of betty baxter the woman in america who went to paradise she saw the place a river she saw green grass she saw flowers a very beautiful place another man in new zealand called ian mccormick has anybody heard the ian mccormick type if you haven't heard it you must get it you write to the hamilton assembly of god church in hamilton new zealand uh, victoria street hamilton that is jim williams old church and they will send you a glimpse of eternity by ian mccormick a man who was bitten by five box jellyfish in off the coast of mauritius he died he went to hell he had a look at heaven and he is a friend of ours and i highly recommend that tape if you don't believe in heaven and hell get hold of his tape and have a look at it and so paradise we'll have a good look at that after you've seen the third heaven after some time the lord will say would you like to go higher you say yes please up to the second heaven that is the starry heavens there you can explore the glories of venus mars jupiter and so on after you've had a good look at that the lord will say would you like to see the first heaven you say yes please this is the throne room of god and can anybody tell me which direction the throne room of god is situated in it is on the sides of the north and you'll see that in psalm 48 and verse 2 we've said it many times we've sung it in church say it with me beautiful for situation the joy of the whole earth is mount zion on the sides of the north the city of the great king astronomers tell us there is a great space in the heavens up there with no stars just a luminous glow coming from the outside in the position of the constellation of orion any of you who don't believe it ask an astronomer and they will tell you that space is there there is the throne room of god they tell us also that that is why the compass points to the north because from the north god controls everything that is made and that will be made the word of god says all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made now we're going to read of the desire of lucifer we're reading in isaiah 14 and we're going to read in verse uh, 13 the five i wills of lucifer read with me please for thou has said in thine heart i will ascend into heaven there's the cloudy heavens there next one i will exalt my throne above the stars of god there's the starry heaven next one i will sit also on the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north then he says that's the first heaven then he says i will exalt my throne above the stars he wants to go beyond the clouds up above the stars i'm sorry verse 14 i will ascend above the heights of the clouds finally i will be like the most high the arrogance of him created by god wants to take over from god although he has been thrown out of heaven now believe me there is a satanic plan to take over this world and i'm sorry to tell you tonight that you are living in one of the test case countries they are practicing on australia and new zealand and it may interest you to know tonight that new zealand actually is a state of australia on the australian constitution did you know that where are the new zealanders tonight please three of us god bless us all did you know that on the australian constitution from the year 1900 new zealand is mentioned as a state of your country it has never been revoked it is still there i received a letter from a lady in auckland she wrote to our government to find out whether i was telling the truth or not and she sent me a copy of the government letter and this is what it said it said uh, it is true what mr smith is saying we are a state officially of australia at least the provision is there for us to become a state and all it would take is ratification of that and we could very quickly become a state of australia did you know that new zealand has no constitution there is no document in new zealand that could be called the constitution and so one of our former prime ministers i won't say his name in new zealand was on a radio program i think it was radio pacific in auckland and one night he was asked by somebody is it true what barry smith is saying that we are a state of australia and that we're going to link up one day this man said this he said barry smith is a doomsday man and he said this also he said if new zealand ever links with australia i will pour a can of petrol over myself and set fire to it now i'm going to send him the matches because look here <laughs> time magazine here it says the um and the date is the september the 14th 1992 there is a kangaroo and a kiwi side by side and the whole article inside says let no man put asunder australia and new zealand head down the aisle to union so they want to link up, link us up as quickly as possible ready for the new world order system under the new world order everybody will give up their rights 
everybody gives up their independence and they all become interdependent and this is a luciferian plan as may be seen by the strange seal on the back of the american dollar quickly through it again the eye in the triangle is not the eye of god it is the eye of lucifer seen on many different occasions in many different places on churches masonic lodges and other places the 13 blocks of stone there represent the 13 power groups who are involved in setting up the new world order which is simply code for one world government next you have two latin words at the top annual chapters which means our efforts are crowned with success to bring about a novus ordo seclorum a new world order of a secular godless heathenistic nature now that's been on the american dollar bill since the year 1933 when america came off the gold standard and it was put on there by a man called franklin delano roosevelt who was a 33rd degree freemason that seal was handed to him in a velvet bag and if you want to read about that read the book second warning you can read how the messenger brought this to him in a velvet bag he had a hood over his head the uh, president didn't know who it was he put that on the back of the american dollar bill 1933 just as america was climbing out of the stock market crash of 1929 and there it is it's been there ever since now may and i were on the mississippi river one day traveling with some friends some of them were freemasons and they said we don't believe what you're saying i said you will when i'm finished with you i have in my pocket here some american dollars i'll get them out here they are i carry them i cover them in plastic to try and keep them looking nice this note is an american one dollar bill dated 1928 this one is an american dollar bill night dated 1938 now remember when roosevelt put that on the back of the dollar it was 1933 i said if you look at the one dated 1938 you will see the seal in the triangle the eye in the triangle the eye of lucifer if you look at the back of the one dated 1928 you will see no seal on that because it was put on at a certain time in history now that is very difficult to get hold of a note like that i happen to have one but i can prove my point at a certain time in history that went on the dollar now if you were in the meeting last night you will learn that the freemasons uh, have a plan and i'm talking of top freemasons here manly hall a top masonic writer said this when the united states of america was settled it was settled for a peculiar and a particular purpose known only to the initiated few and so we have the two we have the pilgrim fathers in america who settled it for religious freedom and they have on the notes in god we trust and then alongside there you've got the occultists and the freemasons who settled it for a peculiar and a particular purpose known only to the initiated few and that is to set up the new world order or a luciferian one world government where everybody loses their independence and everybody becomes interdependent upon everybody else Tonight we're going to read in the book of Genesis chapter 11. Would you turn with me please? We are now reading Genesis 11. Someone says to me, why do you say it twice? Answer, people don't hear me the first time. And they bump one another. I've, I've been doing this for years, you know. You see people bumping everybody and they go like this. What did he say? What did he say? Well, to save you saying that, I tell you twice. We're reading Genesis chapter 11. Read with me, please, verse 1. Talking about the Tower of Babel. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. It came to pass that they journeyed, as they journeyed from the east, they found the plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick of stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose, to whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. I like that. Like the Lord coming down, don't you? He says to all the angels, excuse me, I'm going down. And he comes down to have a look. Let's see what God says. Verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they will begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. If you wonder tonight why we're from so many cultures and speeches, this is why. This is the scripture we're reading now. The heart of man was so arrogant, with Satan in him, he tried to take over from God. So God says, I'll fix that. I'll simply change all the languages around. Let's read the next one. Verse 8. 
So the Lord scattered them from abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord there did confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now some of you will know that on 1st of January this year, 1993, the headquarters of the New World Order came into power, that is the common market in Europe. If you have a common market passport, you can travel freely now into any country of the market. When you travel, as we do, through Greece or England each year, uh, you go through the Athens um, passport control, it says, EC passport holders this way, rest this way. Go up to London, it says the same thing. EC passport holders this way, rest this way. So the common market now has got free entry to anybody with a common market passport and they are rapidly moving on to have another go at the Tower of Babel. You say literally, yes, literally. I now read to you an article from the paper, the Daily Telegraph, dated the 5th of March this year, 1993. They're now getting ready to build another Tower of Babel in the, in the common market. Let me read it to you. The proposed new headquarters building for the European community would be easily the tallest structure in the world. It's going to be 3,280 feet. 3,280 feet, twice as high as the 1,450 foot Sears building in Chicago. Critics of the plan for the kilometre high skyscraper, it's a kilometre high, uh, were topped by the communications mast, call it Project Babel, the most grandiose scheme ever to cross the desk of an EC official. What do they call it? Project Babel. It is man's second attempt to set up a Tower of Babel. And I'm saying tonight that the God who smashed the first one will smash the second one. <laughs> Praise God for that. Because we Christians are on the winning side. If you think that you're in the minority, you might feel that tonight. But you wait till Jesus comes back. You wait till he's running things from Jerusalem. And you're a born-again Christian. You belong to him. You're part of his family. And that day you'll be proud you became a Christian. You'll walk down the street like this. I'm a friend of the king, you know. <laughs> now, I want to talk to you tonight about politics. We talked about, the, we talked about the economic side. There's going to be a worldwide money crash soon. You're all aware of that. Everybody will receive a plastic card. Cash will be cancelled. Oh, here's the poster I didn't have last night. Here it is. Here's the empty wallet upside down laughing. Look. And it's saying these words from the Australian New Zealand Bank. Welcome to the cashless society. Let's say that together. Welcome to the cashless society. Over here. Welcome to the cashless society. Over here. Welcome to the cashless society. And all of you who are dealing with cash are going to be very, very sad in a day to come. We went to a fish market today, we were down a certain place, and Andrew thought he'd go and buy some prawns or something. And he said to the guy behind the counter, do you take cards? And I said, you're wasting your time, son. There are certain shops that don't want cards and don't want checks, you know that. They're dealing on a purely cash basis. I mentioned this last night. Why? They have two sets of books. One for themselves and one for the tax department. Anybody here who is into that sort of a thing, are your days are numbered. Sorry about that, friends. You're, all the cash people here tonight, your days are numbered. Tell your friends. Warn them. We're going to Fiji in a couple of months, I believe. We should be in Samoa next month, Fiji the one after. And when we spoke in La Toka, Fiji, last time, a lot of Indian people run the shops there. They speak the Gujarati language. And, and someone said, you better come down to the meetings and listen to what this man is saying, because I hear what they do over there. They are writing up their textbooks in the Gujarati language. And when the tax man comes around, he can't understand what it's all about. Very clever move. Many people are doing this all around the world. And you'll find the newspaper says that the countries of Greece and Italy are the biggest tax dodgers in the, in the world. It just says that on the newspaper. Uh, because up there they have a system where it is very easy to dodge tax. Do you realise that they would have caught you the other day here in this country with GST? I'm speaking to every Australian. The GST system is a spy system where everybody spies on everybody else. And so if I build a house, I've got to fill in my GST number uh, for the builder, and then whoever comes to do the power, he fills in his GST number, and then the computer does a cross-check on what I say I paid him and what he says he, uh, I paid him. And the same with a plumber and so on, and everybody's checking on everybody with a GST. You were very blessed to get away with that the other day. 
But I'll tell you what, they've got another plan up their sleeve for you. Some of you will know Paul Keating was going to bring in consumption tax a long time ago. And he said, if I don't bring it in, I'll resign. He didn't bring it in and he didn't resign, I noticed. I've got a little note here given to me. Although the GST in Australia was overturned, the writer of this note says, I believe the Labour Party will be pressured by the IMF and G7 to introduce a GST. Your comments, please. I will now give my comments. Here I go. The whole monetary system of the world is governed by the monetary lending groups. I'll put their names on the board here. One of them is called the Bank for International Settlements. You can read all about this in my book, Final Notice, if you're interested in all the details of this. The names are in here. Final Notice. The Bank for International Settlements has a power group within it called the G7. Now, the G7 were in the newspaper today. I got myself an Australian paper, and I see them mentioned already. Then you have another group called the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Then you have another group called the World Bank and so on. Now if the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund wants to lend money to a country, they must go cap in hand to the G7 and get permission to lend money. Because these guys here control the money system of the world, they are very powerful indeed, they set the interest rates up and down and so on. Now the clever plan was this years ago, to set up the world government they lent every country in the world lots and lots of money. Let me ask you a question. Is your country in debt? Yes, it is. You're in debt to the International Monetary Fund, as New Zealand is, and the whole of Africa, and most other countries also. Now, when the International Monetary Fund lends you money, they have things called strings attached. <laughs> and I'll put this on to show you how it goes. This is it here, taken from a paper called the Sunday Tribune, on July the 28th, 1991, probably South Africa, that's right. International Monetary Fund funding lightly but with, lightly but with strings, says here. It, international Monetary Fund assistance has meant subjecting their economies to a brutal form of shock therapy, a brutal form of shock therapy prescribed by the IMF as a condition for receiving financial assistance. I was talking to an African guy the other day, he came down to New Zealand, he said, Mr. Smith, I have seen your videos for years and you are spot on. That's what he said. He said, you come up to Africa, you'll find the International Monetary Fund has lent money to everybody as they have lent money to all the countries of the world pretty well. Now with the money, they have also conditions and these conditions are called conditionalities policies. Conditionalities policies. And the conditionalities policies say this, you will agree with our plans to recover our money. You will set up a goods and services tax, or you will set up a consumption tax, or a VAT, whatever you want to call it. You will do this and you'll do that. And the people of Australia wonder why the politicians never seem to tell the truth. You say they promise us this, then they get a job, and they don't seem to do it. Why don't they? Here's the reason. They can't. Already the policies have been signed and sealed years ago by previous governments, and the people who come to power these days are powerless to change anything. They can't do anything. Not only that, they've also signed years ago things called United Nations treaties, and as soon as the United Nations says jump, everybody in the world jumps and fills in these treaties and signs them and ratifies them. And I want to tell you tonight there's a real wicked one coming out in New Zealand on the 1st of November this year. It makes it illegal for any person to speak publicly against anything else they find uh, not, not very nice. I'm not allowed to speak publicly about anything that I find anti-God. As soon as I do, I can be fined from seven to $50,000 and go to prison for one year as from the 1st of November this year. That is the United Nations Convention called Human Rights. And I've got it in my bag there, and that thing's coming over here as well. It's called harmonization, so everybody will be in harmony and we'll all get along very nicely together. But I tell you what, it's evil, it's demonic, and we'll keep preaching anyway. You always come and visit me. Send me food parcels. You say, all right, well, where are we up to at the moment? Well, we find out now that they want to bring in a different system altogether politically, which means everybody gives up their uh, independence and become interdependent. Would you agree with me that the country of Australia is being ruined? It's not like it used to be. Anybody agree with that? Here's a poor farmer in today's paper. I read this here. It says in the Australian paper today, sheep farmers penned in by drought. 
I am speaking to you at Calvary Chapel, George's Hall, and the date is the 14th of April, 1993. I am reading to you about the sheep farmers. Listen to this. The government's blunt warning to the farmers to quit the stricken wool industry or diversify has a hollow ring for trapped growers like these people here. Four years ago, farmers were being encouraged to grow as much wool as they could. Today, the prices are one third of those levels and growers are being advised to leave the industry. The only options are to leave or seek full-time work while running the property on the weekends. And even in New Zealand, I get telephone calls from all around the world because people know this is my subject. A lady rang me the other day from Hobart. She said, or out of Hobart, she said, Mr. Smith, we are sheep farmers and our sheep is, our farming is going down the tubes. What do we do? And I did the best to advise her the best way I could. Do you realise the same is happening in New Zealand? We used to have three and a half million people in our country with 73 million sheep. Now we've got 54 million sheep. What's happening? They're cutting back on the food supplies. This is part of the world government thing. In your country, what are they doing with the sheep? I saw it on television. They're digging big holes in the ground with bulldozers. They're putting the sheep in there and blowing them away by the millions. Not thousands, but millions. And what are they doing? Chopping down on the food supplies. And here are the rules of the new world order. Write them down, please. Rules. By controlling energy, we can control nations. And by controlling food, we can control individuals. I'll say it once more. By controlling energy, we can control nations. And by controlling food, we can control individuals. Now, under the New World Order system, every country will become responsible for one product in particular. And I'll tell you what you are responsible for. Listen to it. Wheat. Your country is responsible for wheat. What's New Zealand famous for? We are famous for pine trees, logs. We used to be famous for dairy products, for sheep, meat and wool and all this stuff. They're ruining those guys and they're ruining your sheep farmers here. Why? Because you're no longer responsible for meat and wool. You are responsible for wheat. South Africa is responsible for minerals. That is why you'll find in Australia, Wollongong and up at Newcastle, your steel mills have been gradually wound to a close. They're winding them right back because you are no longer famous for steel. You are famous for wheat then every country in the world will have to bargain with one another and they will be responsible to give that product or sell that product to every other country in the world. The only other country in the world that grows pine trees like New Zealand is Chile. And we're about the same latitude there, you see. We grow them very, very quickly indeed. And so, if anybody wants pine logs, they'll go to Chile or New Zealand. If they want wheat, they'll come to Australia. If they want minerals, they go to South Africa and so on. This is the plan for the global village or the new world order. There you have the Eye of Lucifer, this time arrogantly put down on top of the triangle, which means the plan has already succeeded. They've linked the two together. And there's the global village there, all the people. And they're now talking about communications for the whole world. That's why under the new world order, every country in the world is selling out telecom. Do you have telecom in this country? Have they sold it? Not quite. They will. They'll sell it. Every telecom must be sold. All communications must be sold to overseas because they're setting up a global dossier. Next one, let's go back now and look at the recap on the eye and the triangle. Announcing the birth of the new world order without God under the all-seeing eye of Satan, the Antichrist, 666. I'm glad you're in this meeting tonight because you are hearing the truth about what is really going on. Most people in this country haven't got a clue what is going on. Now, did you know the devil's behind this plan? But I want to say tonight that Jesus Christ, the one we serve, has got good plans for you. Let's read it. John chapter 10 and verse 10. Read with me, please. Here we go. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And I give thanks to God tonight that when we become Christians, it is a definite experience. There is no woolly thinking in the mind of God. To be a born-again Christian is to be just as sure of that as the fact that you are married. It's no use saying, Barry Smith, are you married? And I go, I'm not sure. Of course I'm sure. Barry Smith, are you a Christian? Some people say, I'm not sure. What do you mean you're not sure? You either are or you're not. You say, well, I go to church. That doesn't make a person a Christian. 
You say, I read the Bible. That doesn't make a person a Christian. You say, I pray. That doesn't make a person a Christian. You say, I put money in the plate at church. That doesn't make a person a Christian. What makes a person a Christian is a born again experience through the grace of God and through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you have faith in his precious blood, you will be saved by the grace of God. Tonight at the end of this service, you will have opportunity to come and stand here and give your life to Jesus. And you will go home a different person to the person that came into this building. The plan is conducted by a group of people who follow the plans of Fabian Socialism. If you've got a pen, write this down, please. It's very important that you understand this and tell your friends about it. Fabian Socialism is in your country alive and well. I remember Mr. Keating spoke to the Fabian Socialist some time ago. He actually speaks to the group. It is a society working in this country. Um, others in important positions also uh, belong to this group. Now, here are the three main planks of Fabian Socialism. Number one, the plank is called <coughs> gradualism. Gradually, you sneak up on the people, and when the time is right, you hit hard, and then the third plan, the third thing is you never deviate. It doesn't matter what they say to you. They say, we'll kick you out of the next election. It doesn't matter. You must never deviate from your plan. So you approach the thing gradually. It's like breaking in a horse. Anybody here ever broken in a horse? You come up with there are various ways of doing it. We've got a next door neighbor who breaks the bin. You can come up with a sack, for example, and go like this. Flick, flick. And the horse rears up. And so you move back. Then you come in again later, flick, 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 and the horse gets used to it gradually. And as you move back each time, the horse is getting more used to it. And after a few times like that, the horse is very quiet. You can go flick, 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 nothing happens. It just stands still. Then you move to the other side of the horse because you have to break in two sides to a horse. Did you know that? He's got eyes on both sides, you see? <coughs> Most people don't know that. <coughs> they think I'm joking, but I'm not. There are two sides to a horse to be broken in. So you go around the other side, flick, 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 and at last the horse gets used to it. That's what Fabian Socialism does. They move in like this. They say, we will give you an ID. And all the Australians, no! So they move back. Then they move in again. We'll give you a tax file number. All right. The next one. Next plank is called Dispossession. Now, every book on world government I have read tells me this, that every world government group believes that ownership of land and real estate gives people a measure of security. So they want to take your land and house off you. How do they do it? This is how they do it. Two dear old words, tax. You may have heard of tax. And the other word is rates. They keep putting the tax up and up and up. They bring in new taxes all the time, and you think they're finished with you. Don't you believe it? You can have a visit from a nice man from the government one day soon. He walks into your house and says, hello, do you own this house? You say, yes. Good, he says. We're putting a capital gains tax on all these houses. It's all paid for? Yes, good, he says. Do you own all the furniture and everything in this house? Yes, you say. It's all paid for. Good, he says. We would like a list of all that. This is called assets tax. We would like to know all about your knives and forks and spoons, your carpets and your curtains and all the pictures on the wall and the vases and all your furniture will go on the assets list. Would you do that for us? Thank you very much. And then a bit later, and he comes back again, he says, um, do you own that boat outside? Yes, we go have lovely holidays on that up on the Gold Coast. Glad about that, he says. Do you own the caravan? Yes, we have great holidays on that too. I'm sure you do, he says. Put those down, would you? We're bringing out a luxury tax on those things. And then he says, have you received any money from your grandparents who have died? Yes. Granddad died the other day and left me 25,000. Good, he says. We'll call that inheritance tax, shall we? And it goes on and on and on and on and on, up and up and up. And then they put rates on your property so that you cannot pay the rates nor the tax. And then your friendly man from the government comes along and says, this, don't worry, if you can't pay your tax and rates, simply sign your property over to us and we will let you live on the property as a tenant. And that is what they're doing in New Zealand now. In many cases, the people are being driven off their properties. They're allowed to come back, not as owners, but as tenants on their own properties. You will remember this in days ahead, you see. Now, in England years ago, they had a window tax. Did you know that? On houses facing the street with windows, they had a tax on the windows, so people would put boards over their windows. In Holland, I hear they had a tree tax, and the people were busy cutting down the trees so that they wouldn't have to pay the tax. Number three, there is another plan of Fabian Socialism. This is called 
pauperisation. <laughs> pauperisation. You should be writing that down. You say, what does that mean? It comes from the dear old English word pauper, which means to destroy every sector of society using the best method possible to destroy it. I am now going to call out the destroyed sectors in my country, and you can tell me whether they're being destroyed in this country or not. Once you see all this in order, you can say, I see, I see how they're doing it. When you see it little by little, you don't understand, but when someone puts it all together, you can see it very clearly indeed. Here we go. Uh, first of all, to destroy all small business, write that down please, destroy all small business, and then merge all big business. Merge, 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 until we get to about six companies that will run the whole of Australia. About six companies will run the whole of America. About six companies will run the whole of New Zealand. Six companies, the whole of South Africa. And the world government people will control those six companies. Now, if you don't believe me, did you know that all the airlines are merging now? You'll find Air New Zealand and Qantas. Who else have they joined with? British Airways? And they're all linking together. You'll find ANSET and the other one, Australian Airlines. They're all linking up. What's happening? They say they're going to have a global airline. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. It's not a global airline. They said they are moving towards the global airline. The definite article is used there. They want to have one airline for the whole world. A global village, this is called. Have you noticed the way they're cutting down on the armies all across the, the world? They're getting rid of military bases everywhere, shutting them down. Why? They're going to have a one international army for the global village. George Bush's New World Order was called Global 2000 by Jimmy Carter and it is called Novus Ordo Seclorum on the back of every American dollar bill. Don't say it's not happening, it's here now and we need to get right with God. Everybody needs to get right with Jesus and get to know salvation through the precious blood of Christ. Now tonight I'm going through these words, you may have heard some of these words before. Who has ever heard of the word restructuring? Restructuring, do you have that over here? Restructuring in simple English means to change everything to destroy the original system. Have you noticed that the original Australia that you grew up in has been suddenly destroyed within a period of 10 years? It's called restructuring. They use another word. Using words like this is simply another way of saying things so people don't know what you mean. It's very similar to calling a coffin a casket. To the guy that's in it, it doesn't make much difference. <coughs> Who has heard of the word redundant? Or do you use the word retrenched over here? What, redundant? In South Africa, I use the word retrenched. That's the word. Now, what does redundant mean? It means getting the sack in three stages. <laughs> here are the three stages for getting the sack under redundancy. Number one, you're working in the factory wearing your green smock. You're very happily, happily engaged there. One morning, you go to have your cup of coffee, and someone comes in and says, Have you heard the news? This is called stage one, the leak. And so the leak goes out, we're all going to lose our jobs. Everybody weeps, nobody has a cup of coffee, they're all upset. They hang on to each other and they say, it can't be happening, I've been here for 30 years, says Mabel to Millie. <laughs> a couple of days later, after all the crying is over, people have been all upset, Into the management, in comes the management, and this is stage two, it's called the denial. The manager comes in, he said, have you heard the news, you're going to be sacked? They say, yes, is it true? No, it's not true, he says. That is stage two, the denial. Now, by that time, psychologically, all the grief is gone, you see. The people are used to it by this point. They've done all their crying. So the manager denies that everybody feels a lot better at that point. Stage three, a couple of days later, in comes the manager again with a brown envelope and says, down the road with you. That's called do it. Stage three. Let's have the three stages again. Number one, leak it. Number two, deny it. Number three, do it. That's how they do it all around the world. It is called redundant. Um, who has heard of the word pain? There is some pain to be endured. That's what they tell us. But the guys that tell us that never seem to endure any pain themselves. They also use the phrase light at the end of the tunnel. Vote for us and we see light at the end of the tunnel. Let me say tonight, the only light at the end of the tunnel is the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, here are some of the areas that have been pauperized. I'll go through them now. Sugar and steel. Just call out yes or no. Yes, sugar in Queensland, steel in New South Wales and around the country here. Next one. Transport operators have been wrecked. 
by putting a whole lot of taxes, road taxes on them so they can hardly afford to run their trucks any longer. Farming has been decimated. They've driven the farmers off the land. I saw a guy on television in your country one night standing at the gate with his wife and children and the, and the uh, police were there with their car and they said, if you cross that cattle stop, we will arrest you. But he said, I own the farm, it's been in the family for, for years and the policeman said, you cross that cattle stop boy and you're in my police car. So the guy said, here I go. He walked across the cattle stop. Next minute he's in the police car and they took him away. Now in America, they bring in the sheriff, they bring in helicopters, they're doing the same thing there, and they remove the farmers. In fact, I believe there was one farmer going off the land every 10 seconds in the state at one, at one point. Every 10 seconds. They were taking farmers off so quickly in one particular state. They're cutting back on the food supplies and removing farmers. And the sheriff comes in, they bring in trucks, they take away the tractors, the plows, and all the equipment, and all the animals by truck. And the man never goes back on his property again. This is happening all around the world today. Don't be surprised. This is part of the plan. Education is being destroyed. No more, no more um, uh, allowed to whack the children on the bottom. Uh, but uh, it's still legal to belt them over the head with a baton when they get older. That's interesting, isn't it? You can't whack their bottoms, which are perfectly made for it. <coughs> and what are the children doing as a result? They are burning down the schools. And if you check in my country and your country pretty well every day in the paper, there goes another school because the children are angry because they're not being disciplined. Children love being disciplined. When a child goes like this, he throws a wobbly, you know. No! What he's saying is, belt me, belt me. <laughs> Here's another one. Fishing. Are they wrecking your fishing? All around the coast of our country, New Zealand, it is illegal for a commercial fisherman to catch a fish and then eat it at sea. He's got to bring it into the shore, declare it, and then take it out to sea and eat it afterwards. That's the law in our country. You may laugh, but I'll tell you what, that's happening around your country too. Up in Queensland and various parts around the coast of this country, they've brought an ITQ. Individual transferable quotas. Now many of the people who buy these quotas do not want to fish, they're not fishermen, so what do they do? They sell them to overseas and according to the newspaper in New Zealand the other day, it said very soon in our country, the people in our country will sell their quotas to the biggest buyer, probably Japan, and Japan will own all the fisheries around the coast of our country because they've got more money to buy the individual transferable quotas. That's what's happening. It's very bizarre, but it is a world government plan so that nobody feels nationalistic any longer. You lose your feeling of being an Aussie. You become a citizen of the world. You are a member of a global village, they say. That's what they said in the days of the Tower of Babel. I like Margaret Thatcher. She made a comment on this. Margaret Thatcher said at least when they built the Tower of Babel, they all started speaking the same language. That's a good wise uh, statement. <clears throat> Did you know also that they're fiddling with the seeds? They brought on a bill called Plant Breeders' Rights. Plant Breeders' Rights. PBR it's called, or PVR, Plant Variety Rights. Which means that the plant breeders now have the ability and the law on their side to turn the seeds into hybrids. They emasculate the seeds and take out the reproductive organs from the seeds, make hybrids out of them, put a patent on it, so that you can no longer give your seeds to your next door neighbour, you must sell them, but you must pay on the patent as well. Now that's devilish, friends. In the book of Genesis, it's very clear. Let's turn to Genesis, shall we? Read with me about the seeds in Genesis. Someone find it for me in Genesis. Where did God speak about the seeds? I think it's in chapter 1, isn't it? <clears throat> Let's read, shall we, verse, 20, verse 28. Read with me, please. Genesis 1, verse 28. I was speaking to Mrs. Bielke Peterson one day, some of you may remember her, uh, Joe Bielke Peterson's wife, and I said, I believe you are in Parliament down in Canberra? She said, yes. I said, Mrs. Peterson, would you speak against the plant breeders' rights, please? It is a devilish bill. Let's read verse 28. And, the, and God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the, and replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over living, every living thing that moveth on the earth. Verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. Now what the wicked men are doing today is, they're taking the, um, 
they're taking the reproductive organs out and leaving that sterile so you only get one good season's growth out of the seeds and to any of you who want to collect seeds i suggest you get them as soon as you can it's a good idea to have seeds that will reproduce themselves you can still get them in this country there's one group in tasmania called phoenix seeds smithton tasmania phoenix seeds smithton tasmania who still have non-hybrid seeds you see this is a clever move friends this will bring the hippies out of the bush do you hear me this will bring them out of the bush because they can only grow their seeds once then they've got to come out and get some new seeds i was up in brisbane one time the australian agricultural board was having a public meeting about plant breeders rights and I sat in the audience away up there somewhere and this man stood up on behalf of the Australian Agricultural Board. He said, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to bring about through plant breeders' rights bigger cabbages, bigger cauliflowers, bigger tomatoes. And in the middle of his talk I stood up and I shouted, excuse me? And everybody turned around to see who this rude man was. And I said, are you saying this is a good bill, are you? He said, oh yes sir, I said before, bigger tomatoes, bigger cauliflowers, bigger cabbages. I said, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to bring about world famine because if you look on my chart up here, you'll see the Antichrist figure who is coming comes on four horses. I look up here, please. See that little dot on the chart? He comes on a white horse. The Antichrist world leader will bring peace to the earth. He gets on a red horse. There is the Russian invasion of Israel. Don't you think communism is dead? Communism is not dead. I've got a friend who was up there the other day preaching. He was interrogated for four and a half hours by the KGB. Some people think communism's dead just because the newspaper says it. You go up there and ask the Russians. Communism is still alive and well, and they're still going to invade the land of Israel. But it must happen after the peace treaty. Make no mistake about that. Then the Antichrist gets on the black horse. You'll read all this in Revelation 6. He's got scales in his hand and he weighs out the food and charges exorbitant prices. And this is where the food thing comes in. I was talking at this plant breeders rights meeting, you see. And then the last horse, the rider's name is Death. He kills those that don't receive the silicon chip in the right hand or forehead for buying and selling, as is spoken of in Revelation chapter 13. We are living in the last days, you see. And so in this plant breeders meeting, <coughs> this man said, we're going to have bigger, co bigger cabbages, bigger cauliflowers. I said, excuse me. I said, if you go to New Zealand, you cannot buy a natural seed now. You're going to destroy the seeds of the world by fiddling with a natural resource that God made. He said, nonsense. I said, what do you mean nonsense? He said, you're talking nonsense. I said, oh, is that right? I said, do you live in New Zealand, do you? He said, no, I live here. Well, I said, I happen to live in New Zealand, and until you live there, listen to me. That's the way to talk to those guys. Cheeky fellow trying to tell me. <laughs> it's a devilish bill, I tell you, fiddling with the seeds. You, you watch, you'll see all this in the newspaper. Once you've heard it once, you'll say, my word, he was right. He's right, he's right, it's all here. What else are they fiddling with? They're fiddling with the health system. They've mucked up all our hospitals. They wrecked all the nursing. They've made it almost impossible for you to go and get health care. Now, you can't afford it. What's going on here? It's a world government plan. Now, let me tell you the latest plan. In New Zealand, I just heard before I left, all doctors by July the 1st have to register with the local health board. This is by July the 1st. Every doctor has to register. Now, let me try and get this right. He has to buy a computer which fits in with the government computer so they can suck information out of it. Every, every person in New Zealand by 1994 is have to going to register with one doctor in particular. They will give you a medical number that will carry you through. And if you don't get that number, you will pay full rates at all times. If the doctor refuses to sign up with a medical board in his locality, he is not allowed to get the rebate for his customers. Therefore, nobody will go to his clinic. All this is tying up the medical side so that the government has access to everybody's medical records. Post offices, have they wrecked yours yet? They shut down 300 post offices overnight in New Zealand. Turned them into shops. No use trying to keep your post offices when they shut them down. It's called centralisation. I got a telephone call from Canada. A man rang me up. Barry Smith, I said, yes. He said, I came to your meeting in Kelowna, Canada. I heard what you said. He said, our post offices are just shutting down now. I said, quite right. It's all over the world. It's a global plan. But it starts in New Zealand and Australia. We are the world's first. Phone booths. Have they changed all your phone booths? What colour do they used to be? 
Red. I like the red ones best. Who likes the red ones? At least you could find them. These days in New Zealand, all, all ours are green. They merge in with the scenery. Yours are yellow, is that right? Not easy to find them these days. Do you remember the days when you used to put in a coin and you could speak as long as you like for 20 cents, whatever? These days, what have you got to do? You've got to put in a phone card, you see. So you slip your card in and it goes, you watch it and it ticks down. What used to cost you 20 cents could cost you $5. And then it goes, and you put another one in. And away you go again. It could cost $20 to speak on a phone that used to cost you 20 cents. Now the next thing they want to do to you is this. They haven't finished yet. They want to go on beyond that. And they want to move now into electricity cards. And I said this in a meeting. We were up in Scotland last year. And I said very soon, this is in Perth, Scotland, and in uh, Glasgow. And they said, too late, we've got them. There it is, there's the Scottish power card. You put your card in before you use your electricity. I got back to New Zealand, we were speaking at Peter Morrow's church the other day in Christchurch, and the people called out, too late, we've got it in New Zealand already. Power card, there it is there. <coughs> You'll have power cards soon, you put into your box there, and then you pay for your power, and then you use the power afterward. What's going on? This is to destroy everybody's lifestyle as they knew it, to make people confused, and finally they will say, give us a new world government and we will put everything to rest and you can rest again. And that's what they're doing. Did you know also that they are making us pay tax on everything? In New Zealand, if you gather moss for your garden, you have to pay tax on the moss that you gather now. If you pick up an empty abalone shell off the beach in New Zealand now, you have to declare it and pay tax on it. If you save money for your grandchild, you have to get a tax number for your grandchild now because they want to make sure they know exactly who's got what and what's got who. There it is. So I suggest the day is coming. We'll have to do our saving in the old-fashioned way. It is called CIS, cash in sock. We are now reading the Word of God, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. All over Australia, there are people who are dying. Now, I'll tell you something else they're shutting down. Timber mills. Have you all heard about the timber? All over the world, the greenies are moving in and they're shutting down the timber business. You go to Washington State, thousands of timber workers are out of work because the greenies won't let them chop down the trees any longer because of a bird called the spotted owl. And on the main highway in Washington State, there is a sign up put up there by a disgruntled logger. This is what the sign says, I love the spotted owl in brackets. Fried. <laughs> Did you know in New Zealand and Australia, and I see also in other countries now, they're cutting, they're selling the timber overseas, and local timber mills are closing down all over the country. Just the other day before we left New Zealand, we live in the Rye Valley, in the South Island, our timber mill shut down. Do you know why? because the timber mills were paying $100 a tonne for timber, and now the Japanese have come in and they've offered $200 a tonne, and so the men who grow the trees are now selling their timber overseas at $200 rather than pay $100, get paid $100 by the local people. This is happening in your country, and it will be very difficult to build in timber soon because they're selling the timber overseas to overseas people. And if you want to get the timber, you'll have to buy it back from overseas again. It'll go for a trip overseas and then you buy it back again. That's what we're up to at the moment. We're now reading in the book of 6 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 6. Read with me please. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. King James readers. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. What is happening in the world today is a mystery. Unless you come to a meeting like this you would never understand that it is a formulated plan. It is not by accident. Now what do we do in our country? We got rid of the Labour government, we thought they'd made a mistake. So out with them. We bring the national government in and we find that they do exactly what the Labour government did. Of course they do because they are bound to conditionality policies. You people over here, you had an election the other day. Mr Houston was going to give you GST. We stayed up late at night and watched it because we're two hours ahead of you, you see. So when, when they were putting it on your television, we had to wait up very late to see what's going on. So we did was all broadcast over there. We saw what happened. And the people didn't want particularly Mr Keating to stay in power in many cases, but it was the choice of either GST or the Labour government as it was before. They said no to GST and apparently got Mr Keating again. 
Now, nobody is satisfied around the country. They all want a, a group that will come in and change things, but they can't because the policies are already signed and sealed. Our only hope is to get a good relationship with God and start to live on a different realm and a different plane, a spiritual plane, where we begin to enjoy life through the power of Jesus Christ. There it is. This is called the mystery of iniquity. These people are sending people down the road all over the place, kicking people out of their jobs. I've got a verse for them. Let's read, shall we? There's a the book called Hebrews in the Bible. Turn to Hebrews. And just after Hebrews, a little book called James, chapter 5. Read with me, please. It talks about the days coming when cash will cancel. Let me tell you a funny story. I think you need to be relieved for a moment. I was preaching in a town called Penang, in a big hotel there. And there were a lot of rich people there. We had gold buyers, bank managers, uh, stock market men. They were all there. Women involved in finance, wealthy people, millionaires everywhere. The whole meeting was filled with these people. And I said, the day is coming when cash will cancel and everybody will be given a plastic card and you'll lose all your money overnight. Now, when I made the statement, cash is going to cancel, I saw a very wealthy lady turn to another man whom I knew very well and she whispered to him. Now, did you know in a meeting I can see every movement? Because I have been a school teacher 15 years, you see. And although I'm looking out here, my eyes are looking out here as well, is it? Even over here I can see what's going on. If you examine your line of sight, you'll see that. Your eyes sort of go out like this, is it? I saw this lady whisper to the man over there and I thought, I must go and see him afterwards. And so after the meeting, I went across to the man who was my friend. I said, what did that lady say to you in the middle of the meeting? He said, that was very funny indeed. You said, cash will cancel. And she turned to me, she is one of the most wealthy women in Penang, and this is what she said, I will have to invest in gold. And then you said, immediately, let us read from James chapter 5, and this is what we're going to read now, showing the absolute worthlessness of investing in gold or silver. Let's read. Speaking about the last days, the days in which we live, verse 1 through to 3. Go to now, ye rich men, read with me, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. And these guys feel secure because they've got bags and bags of gold hidden away in various spots. The Bible says the day will come, gold and silver will be useless. Real estate will be useless as a form of security against all this. There is only one security, and his name is the biggest name on my chart. His name is Jesus, and his full name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to read the next verse with me just for a minute, would you please? Uh, down here, verse 4. Behold, all together, behold the hire of the laborers, that's people like you who have been made redundant, who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud. There's a lot, of fraud, a lot of fraud going on today, getting rid of people just to make a lot of money, these rich people, you see. And then it says, Crieth the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of the Sabaoth. What does that mean? It means if you are a person who has been made redundant, you have cried out to God, and I want you to know that the God that we serve has heard you. He's going to deal with those people later. Don't you call for revenge. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Don't you revenge yourself on anybody. I've got a lot of friends and a lot of enemies, a lot of people hate me, did you know that? They really hate me, my word, I don't know why, I'm trying to be a nice man. I was on the radio one day in Auckland. <laughs> Here's a good one, I was on the radio in Auckland one day, and as I was speaking, a man called on the, on the talk back and he said, you, so and so, and he bent blankety blank 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 about me. I said, excuse me, sir. I said, I don't think that's fair for you to talk like that about me. I said, firstly, you don't even know me. Secondly, for all you know, I could be a very nice man. In fact, I said, I am. <laughs> that quietened him down. Years ago, we were in Los Angeles. My son, Andrew, picked up the telephone book and he said, this look, Dad. He said, look under the name Jesus. If you check the telephone book, there's, there's lines and lines of people called Jesus. You go to South America, many of you folks from South America know that, you'll find they even play soccer. 
You'll see it in the newspaper, Jesus scored a goal. <laughs> Let's face it. And so my boy came to Bible school in Sydney. He came back to New, back to New Zealand. This is what he told me. He said, the name Jesus is not his real name. I said, what? Are you going to tell me? I've been preaching for over 30 years, and here's a boy who's been to Bible school, comes home and tells me, the one that I'm talking about, that's not his real name? He said, that's right, Dad, that's what I'm telling you. His real name in the language that he spoke was Yeshua. So when his mother called him for tea, she didn't call out, Jesus, come for tea. She called out, Yeshua, come for tea. That's where the word Joshua comes from. And the word Jesus is the Greek version of the word Yeshua. But God is good to us. He lets us call him Jesus. But his full name is Lord Jesus Christ. If you join the Freemasons in the 18th degree, you're allowed to call him Jesus Christ. But that's not good enough because there are many men in the world today who claim to be Christ. They tell me at the last Olympic Games, Billy Graham said, there were 400 men who said they were Christ at the Olympic Games. Wandering around the outskirts there trying to get followers. But there is only one Lord Jesus Christ. He is fully God. He is Jesus, the man that was created by God, and he is the Christ, the anointed one. Fully God, fully man, and the only one who can save us from our sins. That's his name, Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to chase devils, use that name. That moves them along, I tell you. In our country, and in your country, we used to have things called government departments. Who remembers those happy days we had government departments? <laughs> where, where everything used to run very slowly, but very happily. <laughs> there was no stress and there was no tension. Do you remember those days? When you went on the railways, everything was very slow slow and happy. Remember travelling up to Port Macquarie on the train? I said to the lady there, I said, we would like to have soup for lunch, please. There are six of us. She said, I've only got two packets of soup. I said, could we have beans on toast? She said, sorry, there's none. And so on. I said, have you heard the joke? Some of you may have heard of Peter Sellers years ago. Told a similar story. He goes to a restaurant. He says to the lady, I'd like to have spaghetti on toast. She says, spaghetti's off, love. He says, could I have uh, 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 a coffee with toast? She said, no coffee. He said, could I have a piece of toast? She said, toast's off. He says, I might as well have stayed at home. She says, oh, I don't know. Does you good to have a fling now and again? I told the lady on the train. Now, these government departments... We're a bit like that, they're a bit laid back, so we saw one day, we woke up and we saw a new word in the newspaper, and the word was corporatization. And all the un unlearned people said to those who were learned, what does that big word mean? And all the clever people said, oh, that word means that they're going to take the power out of the hands of the government and put it into corporations. And all the people in Australia said, and New Zealand, oh, good, less government control must be good for us. We wake up a few mornings later, we see a new word comes out on the paper. The word is privatisation. And all the people who don't know what it means says to those that did, what does that mean? And all the clever people show their knowledge by saying it means this. It is taking the power further out of the hands of the government and putting it in private hands. And all the people in Australia and New Zealand said, oh good. Then we go to bed and we get up again, having been in and out of bed a few times in the meantime, and we wake up and we see a new word in the paper, and the word is shares. We begin to smell a rat at that point, and we go, sniff, sniff. We write letters urgently to our government members. We say, we are very nervous. We say, you are issuing shares, and we are frightened. Overseas people will buy into our country. And your government member writes you back and says this, don't worry about a thing. Everything is under control. We are only issuing shares at 49% overseas. We will keep the major shareholding at 51%, and all the Aussies and New Zealanders said, oh, good. Remember the key word is gradualism. We wake up a few mornings later, and what do we see? The shares have then gone up to 51% overseas, and at that point, overseas people come in and buy up all the stuff 
that my grandfather and your grandfather paid for in the government department. They lose everything. Lock, stock and barrel is sold overseas and we never see it again, ever. It's gone for good. You say, is this happening all over the world? Yes. You go to the United States of America, listen to what they've sold over there. The Rockefeller Center has gone to the Japanese. Universal Studios has gone to the Japanese. Go to Pebble Beach, California, next to Monterey. They've sold up the golf course there to the Japanese. I was preaching down in te Texas, and a man ran in off the street, and he said, guess what's gone now? I said, what? He said, 7-Eleven is now owned by the Japanese. And you'll find the Australians and the English and the New Zealanders and the Arabs are coming in all over the world, buying and buying and buying. Everybody is buying into everybody's country, so everybody loses their assets. And once you lose your assets, you've lost your nationality, ultimately, because there's nothing to hold you together. We were travelling through, May and I went up to South Africa last year, we went through Mauritius. What a long way around Singapore and away over the Indian Ocean. We got off in Mauritius for a bit of a rest for a couple of days, and <clears throat> as we were walking downtown, they all speak French. And we saw all these people demonstrating on the side of the road with great big banners, and they were calling out in French, Non privatisation. <laughs> or words to that effect. <laughs> and I said to May, I can, I understand that. Funny, I took my family to Tahiti years ago. They speak French up there, you know. We're all sitting in the, in the in a restaurant there waiting for a meal. And, and they said, get the waitress. I said, I'll get her, you watch this. And I said, excusez-moi. <laughs> this lady came over, you see, and one of my children said to me, how did you do that, Dad? I said, I learned that off Miss Piggy on television. In the light of what you've heard tonight, the next question is, what do we do? I said, Lord Jesus, I can't tell the people all this stuff. It'll terrify them because it'll give them no security. I said, give me now some words to explain to the people what to do. Now, would you turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10? In the light of tonight's message, this is only in the light of tonight's message, what to do. Hebrews, chapter 10. We're going to read together verse 23. The first thing we have to do is understand we need to know the Word of God and where to find help in these days. We're reading Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. Read with me, please. Here we go. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. At the end of every meeting, and my wife and I have done this for over 30 years now, we have given an invitation for people to receive Jesus Christ. Some of you have been in church for years, but you have never had a born-again experience. And therefore, I want to point you tonight to the cross of Jesus. And when he died on that cross, he did something that the law could not do. The Old Testament law was a type of shadow that would lead us to Christ. They used to have to keep the Ten Commandments. They had to have certain health rules and so on. Once Jesus died on the cross, it says in the book of Hebrews, God found fault with the first covenant and established a second covenant based upon better promises. I met a lady one night who was into the Seventh-day Adventist church. Many of them are very lovely people. I said to her, are you still keeping the law as well as trusting in Jesus? She said, yes. I said, listen, dear, if you had an old sewing machine, she was a lady from the island of Samoa. Some of you will know in the, in the old days we used to have these machines uh, for sewing, you know. I said, if you had a hand sewing machine, and your child went to New Zealand and bought you a lovely electric one, which one would you use? Could you imagine having the old hand machine sitting there and the electric one alongside? I said, which one would you choose? She said, I think I'd use the electric one. I said, come on, never mind the think. You know perfectly well. Do you know what people are doing? God found fault with the old one, but some people are still trying to have the new one and the old one as well. You can't have the old and the new. It says you've got to leave one behind and accept salvation. And the Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The new covenant is based upon blood. And the blood is the most precious blood of all, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of every meeting, I invite people to come and stand here, say the sinner's prayer, and it goes like this. Watch it, please. I come to the cross, Lord Jesus, where you died for me. I turn away from my sin and I repent. 
and I'm sorry for the way I've gone. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. Number two, I believe if I was the last one on earth, your precious blood would have been shed to cleanse me from sin. For the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. You all agree with that? Some people want to come another way without blood. You'll never get to heaven without the blood of Jesus. Never. Number three. I open the door to my life and I receive Christ. Bible says to as many as receive him, he gives them power to become the sons of God. You make Jesus your sacrifice and you will not go to hell. You will go to heaven because the Lamb of God has taken away your sin. Good news. Oh, I like that. Come on, folks. Who's pleased about that? Wake up. You know, I often think you might not be very thrilled about it tonight, but when you're lying on your deathbed, you will be. You say, how do you know? I've been there. I've had four bypasses in my heart. I've been on my deathbed. I tell you, it was very touch and go. I wasn't sure whether I was going to wake up again. It's a very, very interesting experience, actually. I was lying there. They put me in there. Everybody else was terrified. I saw other people coming in. They didn't know Jesus. When you have an operation like that, you don't know whether you're coming out again, you see. I felt quite secure. They took me into the uh, operating theatre. I looked around and asked a few questions. And as I was going to sleep, they gave me a needle and I heard, I heard the voice of the Lord speaking in me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And then I went to sleep. And when I woke up, I could, or at least before I woke up, I could hear my, my wife's voice. And she was saying scriptural verses over me. And I want you to remember this, that when you visit somebody in hospital, just because they look as if they're unconscious, don't you say negative things over them. Their spirit is still awake, they can hear everything. Don't you walk around saying things like this, he's had it. <laughs> Poor old guy's lying there with his eye blinking like this. And I woke up. And who do I see? I see my wife, May, and my daughter, Becky, looking down at me, and I said, you've been reading the Bible to me? And they said, quite right. They said, what have, we, what have we read to you? And I said, this is what you read. In the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. She said, quite right. What was it? In the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. All together? In the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. That's what she read over me, and I heard it while I was unconscious. Did you know when you get born again, you have a, an experience with God, the only part that gets born again is your spirit? It says his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. You say, what else is left? Well, your spirit is okay, that gets saved. Give it a tick. Now, here are the things that don't get saved. Your body doesn't. Your body can still go to rotten places and do rotten things even after you've received Jesus. Your soul is not saved, and the soul is made up of three parts. The mind the will, and the emotions. And you'll find that only the spirit gets born again. Your body needs to be looked after. That's why it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Be careful where you take your body to after you have been born again. It says, be careful of your mind. Let your mind become the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Our, our wills need to be changed that we may find out what is that perfect will of God. They're not born again, and then our emotions will be different also. After the operation, I found I was crying all the time. People used to come to visit me, and I'd be weeping, and I'd say, who's that, May? And she'd say, it's so-and-so. And I used to feel so unworthy, and I'd say, why do they come to see me? And I'd start to cry. And I used to weep all the time, and one day I came out of hospital, we used to walk down the road together, May and I, looking in the gardens, and I'd see the flowers and the the trees and the grass. I've never been a flower man, I'll be quite frank with you. In fact, a girl gave me a flower at Los Angeles airport and I, I said, you're a Hare Krishna, aren't you? <laughs> she said, yes. I said, you're on your way to hell, girl. And um, she started to run away from me. She was running away from me. And I said, don't run, I'm telling you something. And she ran away. I kept looking at these flowers and grass and trees and I wept and something happened within me as I looked at the things that God made. And then we went to visit a friend. He said, how are you, Barry? I said, I'm getting better. I said, I'm not crying as much as I used to. Some of you have had operations and you find you're weeping a lot. I'll tell you why, because your, 
your covering has been opened up. They've opened up the part of you that covers your soul and your spirit. And a Christian doctor told me that. He said, you pray over your blood before you have an operation because your blood is supposed to be inside your body, protected by the temple, you see. And as soon as they open it up, you're vulnerable. And I wept and wept. Anyway, this man said, how are you? I said, I'm getting better. And then he said to me, are you enjoying the trees and the flowers? I said, oh, yes. He said, you know what the Bible says? He restoreth my soul. And I said, thank you for that. It came out of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I can say that now. A friend of mine who's a sea captain, he said, we used to bury people at sea, and every time we buried them, we used to say the 23rd Psalm. Since I've received Jesus, i found the 23rd Psalm is a psalm to live by, not a psalm to die by. That's good. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let the money system crash, I will not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Whenever all the pressure is on, I can relax by looking at the things that he has made. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death that happened to me, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, that's Jesus, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Everybody in this meeting tonight hear me. The day will come when you will lie on your deathbed, unless Jesus comes back before that. And at that stage, you will be very glad you can say, he is walking with me through the valley of the shadow of death. Don't you ever try and walk by yourself through that valley. You need Jesus very much. That's why you must be out here tonight giving your life to Jesus properly. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Why am I given the gift of everlasting life? Because God wants to build me up? No, for his name's sake. You come to our church in New Zealand, we have a little fellowship called the Canvas Town Fellowship, and we have teaching in our fellowship, and this is what we teach. Everything must go back to God for the glory of God. What modern Christian teaching is coming out today? How I can succeed, how I can be popular, how I can make money, how I can be this and that. It doesn't matter about I. The Apostle Paul said, it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Why am I a Christian? For his name's sake. God will forgive your sin for Christ's sake because he has shed his precious blood to get us to heaven. Let's get our minds off ourselves back onto Jesus, friends. Who agrees with that doctrine? <laughs> Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You say, have you got any enemies? Thousands of them. Do you feel upset? Do you feel under threat? No. At all? Not at all. I just simply sit down at the table and I eat quite relaxed because I know thou art with me. You can be under pressure but know that everything is well when Jesus is with you. Now what does the last bit say? Who can give me the last bit? Now anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The Holy Spirit keeps me happy and joyful. Anybody lives in a sad home tonight, you need Jesus in your home. Husbands, you need Jesus in your home. Wives, you need Jesus in your home. You need to turn your television off now and again. Give Jesus a chance, would you? When I say turn it off, I mean the picture and the sound. And once the thing goes off, you find that you can concentrate on the things of God and enjoy the ways of the Lord and enjoy one another. And if you come and visit my family, you'll find us laughing from the time we get up to the time we go to bed. The only time we stop laughing is when we read the Word of God because we enjoy being together. Some of you have never had that experience. You need to set up families based on the Word of God and enjoy life. Instead of being nasty and saying horrible things to each other all the time, Things like, I told you so, and all that sort of thing. I've heard all that. That is forbidden in my family. No one ever says, I told you so, because that means you're stupid and I'm clever. You don't use those phrases. We try to help one another and bless one another. If I see my wife walking around in bare feet, what do I do? I rush across to my drawer, I get a pair of my old socks, and I say, put these on, you'll get a cold. And I come out of the shower, and she hands me my towel. And she's got toothpaste on my toothbrush. Woohoo! 
Never thought of that, would you? And I tell you what, she cooks me good meals and I look after her. You'll find that if you bless each other, you'll be blessed also. Some of you, you're having trouble in your marriages. Do you know why? I'll tell you why you're having trouble in your marriage. You're too selfish. You're full of self, that's why. Can everybody still hear me, friends? There's a fair bit of noise going on in here tonight. I'm doing my best over all the noise. Would you try and get rid of self, please, and try and do things for others? You husbands and wives, why did you get married? Why do you get married? I'll tell you why. So that you can do the best for your partner. So that you can do the best for your partner. Not so that your partner can do the best for you, but you can do the best for your partner. That's what marriage is all about. You love them so much. No one ever told you that I'm telling you tonight. And so tonight you want to, number one, hang on to your salvation. Salvation includes all those things. Every person who comes to the front of my meetings, I give them a new birth certificate and I give you the time and the date. I remember one night I was preaching in a certain town in New Zealand and I finished the meeting and nobody came to the front. That has only happened about three times in my life, I think. Usually there's people get saved every night of the week, but this night nobody came. Do you remember the old time evangelist? Who remembers them? They used to sing about 20 verses of Just As I Am. Do you remember that? And they'd go on and on, then they'd tell a sad story and they'd do all sorts of things. Anything to get the people out the front. That is not my job. My aim is not to get anybody out here. That's your business. You've got legs. You've got a head to think and you've got a heart to choose Jesus. And if you choose not to come, that's your business. If you choose to go to hell, you'll go there. If you choose to go to heaven, you'll go there. It depends on what you do with Jesus Christ. I was with a friend one day. We were traveling through the countryside of the North Island and we pulled into a petrol station and to get some petrol, there was a guy lying under a motor car here and a mechanic over there. And the man under the car yelled out, Hey, Bill, throw me the 10-inch Crescent Spanner, would you? And so the guy over here yelled back, Go to hell. Excuse me for saying that, but that's what he said. And the man under the car jokingly called out, I will if you tell me how to get there. My friend jumped out of the car. He was a Christian. He put his head under the car and said this, I'll tell you how to get there. He said, keep going the way you're going now. You'll get there all right. And anybody here who wants to go to hell, just keep going the way you're going now. You'll get there all right. No problem. Because the wages of sin is death. Your sin will take you to hell. If you bypass the cross of Jesus, there is no hope of salvation. Let's read John chapter 3, shall we? This is the word of God. Read with me, please. We're reading John chapter 3. I want you to read this verse with me. Very interesting verse. Verse 19. John 3, 19. All together. This is the condemnation. That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Why do people go to hell? Because they love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil and they bypass the cross of Jesus. In this meeting tonight, do not bypass the cross of Jesus. Receive Christ. Anyway, this night nobody came to receive Christ so I said to the children, roll the banner up. And just as we were moving out of the hall, a fellow came running in. He said, Mr. Smith. I said, yes. He said, can you help me? I said, yes. What do you want? He said, I've been home and the voice of the Lord spoke to me and says, go back and talk to that man again. I said, come inside. Who are you? Another man came in over here. He said, I was in my pajamas. I've been to bed. And a voice inside me said, go back. He said, I've come back. I said, come in here. Who are you? And another man came in. He said, I was traveling out in that direction in my car. I was 20 miles away. And a voice said, go back. I said, come in here. Who are you? Five people came back from different parts and they tell me there is no God. How do you like that, friends? And all these people came in and they all received Jesus. It was a year later, I was preaching in another town, and I gave the invitation, and a lot of people came and received Jesus, and after I'd finished, I saw a young man standing over here, and he had a Bible in his hand. He said, Mr. Smith, can I see you? I said, yes. He said, look at my Bible. He opened the front cover, and there was one of these birth certificates in there. He said, read the date on that card. I read the date, and I said, hey... I remember you were one of those that came back out of those five. That's right, he said. I said, you were saved exactly a year ago. He said, wrong. One year and 15 minutes ago. 
And there it was on the card, the time and the date, you see. And I said, where are all the others? He said, they're all living for Jesus, all except for one. He said, Mr. Smith, the other fellow went to a picnic at the beach with the young people, and they were swimming out to sea, and the tide caught him and carried him out. And he said, the last thing we saw of him, his arm was in the air, he called out, help, help, and then his head went under, and his arm went under, but he was living for Jesus right until he died. And his mum and dad received Jesus at the funeral. Oh, I said, thank you for that story. God bless you. I said, why did you come tonight? He said, I've travelled all these miles to ask you this question. Do you ever get tired? I said, often. Do you ever want to go home and give up? He said, I said, yes, we do. We just long to get back to our own bed and sleep there on our own pillow and everything. He said, Mr. Smith, would you remember what I'm saying? I have travelled all this way tonight to say thank you for coming to my town. If you had not come to my town, I would not have had such an exciting life as I've had over the last year. And he started to cry and he said, if ever you feel like giving up, don't stop. Remember me, please. Keep going. Keep going. Praise the Lord for that, friends. And I say this to you tonight, all of you, hang on tight to your salvation. If you're a backslider, you better come back tonight in the name of Jesus. If you hear the voice of God, come back tonight. Now remember what God says. Other people say, I'll come back when I'm ready. No, you won't. It says, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Some of you people have been believers in Christ. You're backsliding now. You need to be out here tonight crying for the mercy of God. Jesus said, no man can come unto me except the Father draw him. Did you know in New Zealand we had a pastor who backslid? He was our pastor. One morning I went to church with my wife. We had about 700 people in the church. I was sitting in the second row. And the pastor came off the pulpit and he said, I can't preach this morning, Barry. Would you come up and preach? I said, I will. I went up and preached. That man went away from God. He left the church, got involved with somebody, messed his whole life up. And I didn't see him again for some years. This man used to pray for the sick. He would cast out devils. He led many souls to Jesus. And then he went right away from God. And I want to say this, that we must not criticize anybody who does that. Let him that stand, let him that stand and take heed lest he fall. And I'm not criticizing the man. I'm saying that's what happened to him. One year, a few years later, I met him. We sat in a car together. I cried with him and I said, you used to be my pastor. You used to preach the word of God to me. What do I say to you? He said, it's no use quoting verses to me because I know them all. I said, well, what am I going to do for you? He said, I don't know. I said, are you going to come back to God? He said, I might one day. Do you hear what he said? I might one day. He wasn't ready then because you cannot come back to God unless the Spirit of God draws you back. And I wept with the man. And I put an arm around his shoulders and I said, I can hardly believe that this is happening to me that I am sitting here in a car with you, who used to be my pastor, and your wife. I said, answer a question, brother. I said, you know the Bible as well as I do. The Bible says, when the devil leaves a man, and he goes away, and he, he comes back, and he finds the house is clean, he comes in again with seven other devils worse than himself. Let me ask you a question. As a man of God, who was my pastor, tell me the truth. Are you worse now than what you were before? He said, much worse. The Bible is correct. That's a challenge, friends. Be careful, please. No matter what devil is knocking at your door, tempting you to do this and that, don't do it in the name of Jesus. Hang on tight to your salvation. And God will bless you if you hang on. Be true to the end. Now the next one I've got here is found in verse 24. I like this one. We're reading Hebrews 10, 24. Read with me, please. You've heard a lot about politics tonight. You've learned about the world government politics. You now understand about the world government economy. Let's see what God is saying now tonight in the book of Hebrews 10, verse 24. All together. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Verse 24. Stir up love what does that mean it means that when you become a christian when i become a christian we should be the most loving people in the district when you are sitting in church on sunday morning before the service finishes would you look around please and and see if you can take someone home for lunch with you do i hear an amen or do i hear people saying i hope someone asked me home for lunch
I was preaching at a big seminar in New Zealand one day. There was thousands of people and the pastor stood up and said, look around please and if you are a stranger here, make yourself known so that someone can ask you home for lunch. I said, what sort of a statement is that? Can you imagine that? You're a stranger in the service tonight and you stand up like this and you say, hello, <laughs> I am a stranger here and I am making myself known to you so you have the privilege of asking me home for a meal. What a ridiculous statement. It is the job of every church member to show love to the people who come into their fellowship. And if you run your fellowship like a family, you'll be inviting people home. Students, single people who are living in hostels, all those sort of people, widows, ask them home for a meal. There was a church in this town, I preached in this town, a lady told us, she said there was over 2,000 people in the church, and I put a message over the pulpit, my son and I would like to go home for a meal with a Christian family. Would you please ask us home for a meal? Do you know that woman said over, about 2,000 people went past her after the service. They said, hallelujah, God bless you, praise the Lord, and all that sort of thing. But not one of them stopped and said, would you come for a meal? My son and I went home and ate a lonely pie together while the others went home and ate their roast dinners. There are many lonely people around. Some of you say, look here, they'll eat all my food. Let me say today, that is correct. <laughs> they will eat everything. Let's read, shall we? <laughs> Hebrews 13 and verse 2. Let's read it, shall we? We are reading Hebrews 13 and 2. All together, please. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Do you know when we get home to our place in New Zealand, I wouldn't be surprised to find somebody sleeping in my bed. We often get home, May and I have nowhere to sleep. The house is full of people. She's so given to hospitality, you'd think she'd be worn out after a trip. She travels all around the world a couple of times a year, goes home and the house is full of visitors. She's got them under the table, sleeping on all the couches. Our bed's gone. Why does she do it? Because the Bible says, be given to hospitality. Hebrews 10.25 Altogether, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, brackets, as the manner of some is who stay at home watching television, close the brackets, <laughs> but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Apparently we need more fellowship as we see the day of Christ approaching. Did you know Jesus is coming back? Let's say it together. For the Lord himself, here we go. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and so shall we ever be together with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Jesus is coming back again. And so the Bible says we need more fellowship as we see the day approaching. Meeting with Christians, birds of a feather, they always have. Never see the sparrows flying with the hawks, you see. And so you stick with your own people. You learn the ways of God. When you meet each other, you quote a Bible verse. The other guy says, what do you think of this verse? You talk about the things of Jesus as well as natural things. You enjoy life, but you include Jesus as part of your natural life. That's wonderful. And I like being a Christian. Who likes being a Christian? I wouldn't go back. It's nonsense. The other life's stupid, you know. You ever look at what you did before? You say, this looks so ridiculous. Did I live like that? What a boring life without Jesus. It's a bit like Samson grinding at the mill with his eyes poked out. Get up in the morning, off to work. Go home, have your tea, sit and watch television. Get up and go to work the next morning. Have your tea, sit and watch television again. Big thrill. Off to work the next day, get up again. Come home, we're going to have a thrill tonight, we're going shopping. That's not what life's all about, friends. Life is all about communion with God, through Jesus. You're made for better things than that. There's a man going through the 
through a common ground in England. He sees a little boy there, he's got a cage. He said, what are you doing with the cage? Boy, he said, I've got some skylarks in my cage. And the Christian man says, how many have you got? He said, three. And he looked in the cage and these skylarks are in the corner of the cage like this. And the Christian man said, how much for the skylarks? He says, ten shillings, sir. You'll get the cage as well, thrown in. And the Christian man took out his wallet. He said, I'll pay for those. I'll buy those things. He buys the cage and the skylarks and he opens the door. He said, watch this, son. I'm a Christian. He says, go birds. He gives them a flick and they all come out the door. And the next minute, the three birds are flying up in the sky. And he said, skylarks, you were not meant to be in that cage. You're supposed to be up there enjoying life. And some of you are in a cage tonight. You've got nothing in life to interest you. I'll tell you why. Because until you know Jesus, you've lost the most important quality of life. The most essential part of your life, the foundation of your life, is spiritual. And when you get that right, everything else comes right when you build on Jesus Christ. The Bible says no other foundation can any lay than that which is already laid. Jesus Christ is the rock of salvation. And I look at the people in the street and I look at them in the supermarkets and I think, there are millions and millions. Why did he choose me? I don't know, but I'm glad I'm chosen to be a son of God. Praise the Lord for that, friends. Let me tell you a story and close the meeting. Some of you will think the story is not true. I'm sorry if you feel that because it is true. My wife is a witness to every word. We have an office on the Isle of Wight, which is off the coast of England. We were preaching on, uh, on the Isle of Wight one evening in a hotel meeting and to a lot of people. And when the invitation was given, a number of people came to the front to receive Jesus. Amongst them was a woman with blonde hair and her daughter, blonde hair, about the age of 18. I remember those two in particular because when they came up, they had a special story to tell me afterwards. After they had prayed the sinner's prayer, got their new birth certificate, the others went home. The lady said, Mr. Smith, can I speak to you privately? I said, what happened? She said, my daughter at home tells me everything that you have told us in this meeting tonight about Bible prophecy. I said, what? How old is your daughter? She said, about one and a half. I said, one and a half? What do you mean she tells you Bible prophecy? She said, I go home, my daughter in the cot changes into an old woman, her face changes into an old woman, and she begins to prophesy and tell me the stuff that you're telling us tonight. I said, now look, I don't want to be rude, but I want to tell you about your daughter. <laughs> I said, your daughter has got a devil. And the best thing you can do is get rid of it in the name of Jesus, because every Christian who is born again has the power to chase devils in the name of Jesus. Let's read that, shall we? Mark 16. Let's read it together. This is the Word of God. Some people say this doesn't apply. Well, that's all right if you believe that. Mark 16. Let's read it, shall we? Verse 17. I want you to read it with me, please. All together. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. That's what it says there. If you believe, you can do it. Now, if you go with us to the islands, we have a number of folks here tonight. Pastor Polo is here. He's my cousin from Samoa, he's a Samoan pastor, and others are here tonight. If you go to that island, you'll find that there are many devils over there. And you'll find that even in this country there are devils, but some of you don't know about it because you've never been in that realm. Did you know in this meeting tonight there are people who have been involved in devil worship and Satanism, and they know about devils? I want to say something tonight to anybody who's a Satanist or a devil worshipper or a witch. You're going to hell forever because you will join your master in the lake of fire. And you're serving a losing master. If you turn to Jesus, you'll serve the winner. Because Jesus said, all power is given unto me. How much power? All power is given unto me. And you can try and put a curse on me tonight if you like, but your curse will fall on the floor because I'm covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> now you need to hear that tonight. Don't serve a loser, serve a winner. Jesus is his name, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I said to this lady, I'm going to write a prayer for you. I've got to leave now. I've got to go north up the island, up to England. You take this prayer and pray it over your baby. So I wrote on the back of one of these birth certificates a prayer, and May and I left the island. We went back a year later, and when we got back there, one of the local Christians said, there's a couple want, to visit, want you to visit with them, and they want to have lunch with you at a local restaurant. I said, okay, who are they? He said, you remember the woman and the daughter? And they, she told, he told me the details. I said, yes, I do. We sat in a restaurant, the man and the woman and May and I, 
And he said to her, you start your story. I said to the woman, what happened when you went home? She said, that was amazing. I took the piece of cardboard and I went into my daughter's room and there was the baby in the cot, lying quietly. And I got out the piece of paper and I thought, well, she's looking all right now. She's not looking like a devil now, so I'll pray the prayer. So she said the words that I wrote on the cardboard, Satan, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ whom I serve, I come against you in his precious name and present his precious blood at you. You will leave my baby through the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Something like that, you see. And then I said, what happened? She said, absolutely nothing. So I walked away and I said, so much for Barry Smith and his prayer. She said, I got to the door and all of a sudden there was a horrible scream came from the cot and a voice went, no! I'll tell you what that was. That was the devil coming out in the name of Jesus. Because anybody who is a believer in Christ can chase devils in Jesus' name. You will never use another name, only the name of Jesus. There's no other prophet, there's no other religious system can ever do what the name of Jesus will do. I'll tell you why, because Jesus is God. And I'll tell you, anybody here who serves a prophet, your prophet can never do what our Jesus can do. You're better to serve Jesus. And I said, what happened next? She said, oh, I freaked out. Some of you know what that phrase means, I freaked out. I understood that very well. She said, I ran into my bedroom, I jumped into bed next to my husband and pulled the blankets over my head. <laughs> and the husband said to me, what's all this about? And she said, I told him from under the blankets what was going on. And he said to me, where is this Barry Smith? I'll knock his block off. Now by that time, May and I had left the island. That is the advantage of being a travelling preacher. You find your bullets and move on, you see. I said, go on, tell the rest of the story. She said, okay, it's over to you, love. So he started to speak. This is what he said. He said, I could have wrung your neck, Barry. He said, I was so angry you upset my family. I just wanted to get my hands on you. He said, I was an atheist. A few days later, I got a pain down here and I found, I went to the doctor, he said, you've got cancer. And the cancer is eating away the tube from your urethra to your bladder. I think it was down that area. And he said, they took me to hospital, they operated, they put a plastic tube into me. And he said, I was in agony. I used to lie down, I was in agony. I stood up, I was in agony. When I sat down, I was in agony. He said, no position would take away the pain. One night, my wife said to me, there is a preacher coming from England, from the mainland. Would you come with me to the preacher? And he said, no, I won't. I'm an atheist. She said, why don't you come and just sit with me in the back seat? He said, all right, I'll come with you. So he sat in the back seat, and the man of God from England was up there on the platform. He invited people to receive Jesus, like I'm doing tonight. Then he prayed for the sick, and this man was rebellious. He said, I will not go to the front. I don't believe in God. He said, that man's a fraud. And the next minute, the man finished praying for everybody, and the wife said, look, if you're not going to see him, I'll get him to come and pray with you. So up on the platform she went, she said, would you come and pray with my husband? He's a rebel, he's sitting in the back seat. And the man of God went down, and this man said, this is his testimony, he said, he came up to me, I sat in my seat in pain, and the man of God reached out his hand, touched me on the head, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he said, a, a heat went through my body, and all the pain disappeared. They took me back to the hospital the next day and God had built a new tube into me and the plastic one was gone. There you go. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I say. Now this is what he said. He said, I have invited you here for lunch today with your wife not to knock your block off, but to say thank you very much. Now that's a story. I want you to know the God that we serve is alive and well. He has a son whose name is Jesus. The word Yeshua means saviour. And he wants to save you and make you one of his people. There is an agreement to be entered into. It's called a covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood. As far as he's concerned, he will save you. It is your job to get out of your seat and confirm the covenant by saying the sinner's prayer. It goes like this. I stand at the cross where you shed your blood for me, Lord Jesus Christ. I turn away from my sin. I believe you died for me. I love you. Tonight I want this born again experience. As the world government carries on the new world order, the eye in the triangle, the devil tries to get a hold of my life. He'll never get me. 
because I am born again into another kingdom, the kingdom of God. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I'm going to invite you to get out of your seat tonight. Come and receive Christ with your husband, with your wife, with your friend, young people and old. And as you do it, you'll be saved by God's grace. You say, do I have to get out of my seat? Yes. Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him also will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Listen, verse 33. Whoever shall deny me before men, stay where you are, him also will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. It means simply this. If you want a lawyer at the judgment, would you stand for Jesus Christ here? And he will stand for you there on that most important day. Let me pray for you now as the musicians come. Father, I pray tonight that through the word of God, it please God through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. Bless those tonight who make their way to Christ and do a good job and save them, we ask, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we stand and sing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Let's stand, shall we? Amen. sing the last verse you know I've, I've been doing this for many years now but I never cease to rejoice when I see people doing this let me pray father bless those who are still struggling give them power to come in Jesus precious name turn to the person next to you and say please come with me somebody will come with you if you're you say I can't get out yes you can people will move as you make your way to Jesus you move and he'll give you strength to do it let's sing the last verse all together when we Counselor with each person tonight. Make your way now, please, counselors. coming tonight I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer with all these people in just a minute I'd like to do that counselors I'd like to pray it myself and then if you'd like to go with them and just have a little word of prayer with them again 
Anybody else coming to receive Christ, would you wave your hand tonight? This is your night of salvation. For the first time or a backslider. Would you let me know, please? It's a great privilege to get saved, I'll tell you that now. Don't think you're doing God a favor by getting saved. It is your blessing. Anybody else, please? Just make your way quickly now. God bless you. I know the battle that goes on. This is good, brother. God bless you then. It's lovely. Thank you, dear. God bless you. There are others coming. Those of you watching the video, this is your moment of salvation also. Because we're going to pray the sinner's prayer right now. Anybody else coming? Would the congregation be seated as we pray with those who are here? Just be in prayer for these people, please. God is with us. This is the hour of salvation. Would you please look at the board, everybody, who is at the front tonight to receive the Lord? I want you to answer me with the word yes, if this is what you're doing. Tonight I come to the cross, Barry, where Jesus died for me. I repent of my sin. It means I turn away from my sin. I'm sorry. And I turn to Jesus. Number two, I believe if I was the last one on earth, Jesus would have died for me. He loved me so much. God so loved the world. He loved me. Number three, I don't care who knows about it. Tonight I am opening the door of my heart and I am receiving Jesus inside. And he's going to live in me and give me everlasting life at this moment. If that's what you're doing, would you say in a nice loud voice the word yes? God bless you. You Christians, be happy tonight as these folks join our family and those watching the video, you pray the prayer with them and you will be saved at the same time. Let's pray, shall we? I want the counsellors to help them through also. Don't talk to me, talk out loud to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I come to you tonight because I am a sinner. Tonight, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin, I turn away from my sin, and I turn to you. I believe, dear Lord, you died for me. Your blood covers my sin. And I thank you now. I open the door to my heart. Come in, Lord Jesus. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me your child. As I receive you by faith. I close the door now. With Jesus inside. Help me to live for you. Every day until you come again. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Tonight I have received you. In the presence of these witnesses. And you have received me. I love you and praise you. For saving me tonight. Dear Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you keep your eyes closed and hear the promise from the word of the Lord? John 1, 12, listen to it. But as many as received him, that's Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That includes ladies and men. Would you look at me, please, dear ones? And I'm looking at you and I'm saying to you, welcome to the family of God. Praise the Lord. God bless you. In verse 9. In verse 9. Ten past nine, you have received Jesus. Wonderful. What's the date today? 14th, is it? Is Jesus, Jesus in my heart? Happiness is to know the Savior living my life within his favor. Having a change, changing my life.
Happiness is our Lord. Happiness is our Lord. To be. 